Good morning, friends, and welcome to the Sunday morning message from First Baptist Church in Winsboro, South Carolina. Thanks for joining us today. Of course, this is just a little synopsis of what will be our live message here in a little while. And uh, as we deal with this, we are coming to the end of the book of Hebrews. Only a few messages left in the series we've been working on this summer. And we're going to park on one verse in particular today. It's found in Hebrews chapter 13, verse number three, as we talk about freedom from bondage. And as we talk about this kind of bondage, we're talking about those folks that might be imprisoned. Now, I know there are a lot of literal prisons you can be in, but I want you to think about how many other kinds of prisons we end up being trapped in and how important it is for those of us who may be free from certain bondages, bondages to sin and to self and to uh, all the things that might confuse and mess up our minds in these days, to be serious about releasing others and helping others that are trapped in those situations. Well, in Hebrews chapter 13, we read in verse 3, Remember those in prison, as though you were in prison with them, and the mistreated as though you yourselves were suffering bodily. Wow, this is quite an admonition from the writer of Hebrews to tell us to think about those folks we don't like to think about. You see, when it comes to putting people away, we love to get them out of sight, out of mind. We don't want to think about any responsibility to minister to them. Why, they're just getting what they deserve. Anyhow, let's put them away and, you know, if we're really lucky, they'll just die there and we won't ever have to see them again. And that's the attitude that many people have toward those who are caught up in all kinds of prisons, the literal jail cell, the prisons of addiction, and other things that take these people away from us and they're out of sight. They're not in our worship services. We're just joyously celebrating on Sunday and perhaps even celebrating the idea that they're not with us. But the Lord Jesus himself said we have a responsibility to those. And especially recognize that some are perhaps there for all the wrong reasons. You know, we've watched this happen in other countries, but now even in our own, we're seeing one group of people arrested because they may be on the wrong side of an argument or a political situation. Yes, we have political imprisonments now in the United States of America. While some hardened criminals who've already committed crimes are released early or even released without bail or very little bail after committing a crime and end up committing more. What in the world is going on? Well, in every one of those cases, there are people who need to be ministered to. You want to reduce the crime rate? Then you need to introduce people to Jesus because only Jesus can change the heart and only Jesus can make it so uh, so life-changing because of a new relationship. The Bible says all things become new, that you can take that hardened criminal, that person that's really been suffering, even if they didn't deserve it, and turn their lives around and make them something positive for the Lord Jesus and positive for the world. The story was told of the Welsh revival in which something swept across the world during that time, and especially in Wales, Things change so rapidly that in some of the mines there in the area, work came to a standstill because suddenly the mules couldn't understand their masters. Men who had been filled with cursing and vulgarity in their speech suddenly changed the way they talked so much that the mules couldn't even understand them. (laughs) Policemen had so little to do because the crime decreased that many of them just formed singing groups and went around singing at the church meetings and revival meetings. (laughs) Wouldn't you love to hear that again? Wouldn't you love to see society changed by the gospel instead of someone saying, we're going to have to clamp down because everyone is so evil? It would be great to see the goodness of society return, wouldn't it? That's the real freedom we're talking about. But for that to happen, we've got to take on the job of ministering to people. Isn't that what Jesus told us we should do? It's exactly what he said in Matthew chapter 25. Now, please don't try to put this into some kind of context where, oh yeah, but that doesn't apply to us. That's 
only for a group of people at the end of the tribulation or something. You know, there are folks that love to find reasons to dismiss Scripture so it doesn't apply to you. Friends, do not think this Scripture verse goes without application for us this morning. Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 31. Hear the words of the Lord Jesus. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom of prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Now, do you see the objects of ministry? They're all people who cannot help themselves, or in a difficult situation, sometimes imprisoned. And yet, the people of God reach out and make a difference in their lives. Not for their own benefit, obviously. They're using their resources, they're taking their time, they're giving of themselves so that they can make a difference. Well, in verse 37, the reaction is quite interesting. Of the righteous who said, now, now, what, now wait, wait a minute, I was, this is the Lord speaking, you were hungry, you were thirsty, you were in prison. What are you talking about? So in verse 37, it says, the righteous will answer him, Lord, when we, did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Oh, wow. Would you like to minister to Jesus today? Would you like to reach out and touch him and bless him? Well, then let's get out there and feed the hungry. Let's go to the prisons. Let's go to the hospitals. Let's visit Let's take a prayer and a blessing and maybe a cup of cold water in Jesus' name to someone who needs it. And the king will welcome you with open arms saying, you did it to me. I want to just give a great shout out to some folks that aren't even with us today. The late Jack Morrison was one of those guys at Perimeter Road Baptist Church in Valdosta, Georgia with us that started a prison ministry. You know, I've been gone from there so long, I I can't tell you what's going on in the Valdosta Correctional Institute, but I know what was going on back then. He and Gene Harris and some of our other uh, folks just decided they needed to minister to these folks in this maximum security prison. I mean, we're talking about some of the worst criminals of all. And in their, you know, in their defense, they were there for one reason and one reason only, to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and to touch the lives of these men in a men's prison that needed Jesus. We saw miracles begin to take place in the lives of these guys. They would do a service, a worship service on Sunday nights, and we used to kid about how the worship service at VCI was better attended than back then we did a worship service, a PM worship service at our church, that there were more people in that service than were on campus at our church. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but you got to understand, you have a captive audience. They can't, What else are they going to do, right? But, you know, it was a great opportunity for our folks to go in and minister to those prisoners. They also started through Chuck Colson's ministry, of course, uh, a uh, a ministry of Bible study and discipleship with those prisoners. So you had the small groups and the large worship services. And every Christmas, while I was at Perimeter Road Baptist Church in Valdosta, our choir would go not to the mall to sing, not to sing three or four extra times our Christmas musical on campus and invite the world to come in. No, we would actually go into the prison and sing for those prisoners. 
it was an eye-opening experience for some of our folks who'd never been behind those big iron gates in VCI. But they had a beautiful experience, and they began to meet some of these men whose lives had been changed by the gospel. And sometimes being introduced to one of them would, would be uh, characteristically uncomfortable. As, you know, Gene would be introducing us and say, oh, now this is so-and-so. And remember, he's the one that hacked his, his grandmother to death, you know, but now he's been saved. <laughs> I mean, you know, you could hear some stories like this and think, what? But then to watch the presence of the Holy Spirit just come down on these guys, tears roll down their cheeks and some talking about how they had been led to Christ in prison. Some of them even saying things like, the best thing that ever happened to me was being put in jail because... Then and only then was I confronted with my life and then given the opportunity to meet Jesus, to understand forgiveness, to understand a changed life, that I could be better. Oh, friends, it was during those great times that we saw the power of prison ministry and what it might mean. But you know, we also, through Chuck Colson's ministry at Prison Fellowship, adopted some other things when we were in the association in, in Asheville, North Carolina. We were part of the Angel Tree ministry. Now, I know Angel Tree is sometimes used as a word that uh, several different organizations use around Christmas time. But for us, Angel Tree meant getting some things that a prisoner's family might need and visiting that family on behalf of that prisoner and just loving them in Jesus' name. Because the unseen sufferers, are the family members of that person who's in jail. And, you know, they may be in jail for a reason that they really need to be in jail. They need to be incarcerated. But the family suffers often in silence, having to deal with circumstances and situations that they are ill-equipped to, to deal with. And, and few people really want to assist them. They almost look at them as if they have the plague oh my goodness, you're the family of that guy that they jailed for and then you fill in the blanks and all of a sudden you stigmatize that family with the crime that their loved one has committed even though they had nothing to do with it. Oh friends, during those times we saw God working as well, just touching the lives of people and giving hope and restoration during their times of deepest need. Isn't that what Jesus is talking about right here? Isn't he talking about us reaching out to folks? And whether they're in a literal prison or if they're in one of those situations that you know about and they still live in your neighborhood, and they're right around the corner and someone needs to touch them where they live. That's what ministry is all about. That's why it says in Hebrews 13, 3, remember, don't forget about these people. Don't forget about the ones in prison. And he says, listen to this, Remember them as though you were in prison with them. In other words, you're supposed to try to relate and think about what it might be like if you were having to live the same lifestyle. And with the mistreated as though you yourselves were suffering bodily. It's only by that kind of feeling, that identification that we might have with them that we're able to minister most effectively. But I want you to think about who our prime example is. It's the Lord Jesus himself, the one who says, I can understand and feel your deepest pain, agonies, and hurts because I left the throne of glory where everything was comfortable for me, and I came to live among you and serve. I came not just to die for your sins, but also to experience all of your pain and suffering so that when you pray, you call on me, and you call in the name of Jesus upon our Heavenly Father for the answers to your prayer, then you know you have someone who feels what you're feeling, can identify with your deepest hurts, who, yes, was even imprisoned unjustly <laughs> and was thrown in the bottom of that pit to await a monkey trial and a crucifixion, all violating all the codes of justice of that day. C says, so I can feel what you feel in your times of injustice. Oh, friends, our Lord knows exactly what we're going through, and he knows what they're going through. And his hand of forgiveness still reaches out across the centuries. And through his precious blood, we can see those who have been in the deepest, most hurtful situations. We can see them come to Christ 
be saved and be a part of this family of God. Oh, friends, that's what this verse is all about. Don't forget it. Don't leave it alone. Instead, let's live it. That's what the Lord Jesus wants his disciples to do today. Well, thanks for spending a little time with me today. I hope you'll worship somewhere in person, but if you can't, join us on YouTube and Rumble each and every day. Like our channels, subscribe to them so that we'll get even more viewers. And listen, let's keep sharing the good news of the gospel and the message that people need to hear until Jesus comes. God bless you.